Hey, good morning, everybody. Great to see you today. Welcome to Lakes Free Church, and we're so glad to have you here for worship with us this morning. Uh, if we haven't met, my name is Jason Carlson. I'm the senior pastor here, and uh, we're just uh, excited and blessed to be together and to worship the Lord together this morning. Uh, just one quick announcement for you today. Next week, we are beginning Holy Week here at Lakes Free Church. Uh, next Sunday, we're celebrating Palm Sunday, and uh, that evening, if you're able to join us, we're going to be having a prayer gathering t- uh, at 6 p.m. that night just to be praying for Holy Week and praying that God would work uh, through the ministries of our church uh, during that season, Good Friday and Easter. Uh, So come on out and join us if you can for that. And then uh, the following weekend, we have our Holy Week celebrations, Good Friday, two Good Friday services this year, 5 o'clock and 6.30. And then on Easter Sunday morning, uh, we have three services at 8 o'clock, 9.30 and 11. We also have our annual uh, student ministry Easter breakfast fundraiser that's going to happen that morning. So if you want to come and join us for breakfast on Easter Sunday, that's always a great time as well. So uh, please join us. We're going to have a great time celebrating the resurrection of our Savior and Lord, and uh, it's going to be a real blessing. So let's uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning, and uh, we're going to have some great time praising his name and worshiping together. So let's uh, commit this morning to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you for uh, just what a true privilege it is to come into your presence, to worship you. And Lord, we want your name to be glorified this morning. We want to lift your name on high. And Lord, uh, we pray that as we sing, as we pray, as we read your word, as we preach later, Lord, we pray that in all these things, not only would you be honored and glorified, but that you would remind us of who you are and all that you've done for us and your amazing grace in our lives. And so, Lord, we look forward to worshiping you now. We commit this time to you. We pray this in the great name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can stand. We're going to get our hearts ready to worship. When God adopted us into his family, he gave us a new identity. He changed who we are. He brought us into a family. So let's read this together. This is some truth from God's word in Romans 8. We're going to read this out loud together. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. Amen. Let's worship the Lord. Let's thank him for that truth. Yeah. 
Christ is- 
Yeah. 
exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name above all names be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place you alone deserve our praise you're the name read a selection from Matthew. This was kind of a, just a, a passage that jumped out to me in my, you know, you're doing the reading plan, and this is just like kind of a day in the life of Jesus. But it really, it really jumped out at me. It says, Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee. And he went up on the mountain and sat down there. And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put him at his feet and he healed them, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. And we've been singing a lot about the forgiveness of God, and that, that is who Christ is. He is the forgiver, he is the healer. And, and that's the beautiful thing about Jesus, we don't need to sacrifice one virtue for another. He is the healer, he's the forgiver, he's the savior, and he also is the healer. And so in this next song, we just get to magnify Jesus for his healing power, the spiritual healing, the physical healing, all of it, that he's still working in our midst today. So let's, let's just continue worshiping him. We'll sing You Are Here. And you are here Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, you're working in this place. I worship you, I worship you. You are here. Moving in our midst, I worship you, I worship you. You are here, working in this place, I worship you, I worship you, cause you are where you make miracle work. Promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you, it's who you still are, you are, we make miracle work, promise keep light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are.
Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. be seated. Well, thank you, worship team, for blessing us, bringing us into the Lord's presence this morning. America is a nation literally drowning in debt. Earlier this year, back in January, our national debt topped $34 trillion for the first time. Economists tell us that we are currently adding $1 trillion of debt to our national debt every three months. Today, the government spends $2 billion a day, $2 billion a day solely on paying off our nation's debt. If you were to do the math, every single person in this room Every citizen in our country owes over $102,000 to our national debt. On a personal level, the debt situation doesn't look much brighter. The average American today owes over $100,000 across all forms of debt. Mortgage payments, student loans, car payments, credit card payments, Americans today owe $1.1 trillion in credit card debt. 49% of Americans carry that debt over monthly on their credit card bills. Americans today owe $1.74 trillion in student loan debt. And Americans today own $1.5 trillion in auto debts. The average American carrying $23,000 in car payments. On top of that, 19.6% of Americans carry ongoing medical debts, and the situation goes on and on. Friends, debt is a serious problem in our country today. But as serious as our financial debts are, God's word tells us that there's another debt that we owe, an even more significant debt, a debt to God, a penalty do for violating God's moral will for our lives. This is the debt we're going to explore today, the debt that we owe our holy God. And we find this debt in the fifth petition of our Lord's Prayer. 
Over the last few months, we've been studying Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, this, this great teaching that Jesus gives us on what it means to be Jesus' people. What does it look like to, to walk in the ways of Jesus, trusting in him, following him, living out the ethics of his kingdom in the world today? And as we've seen over the last few weeks, right here in the heart of this Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer. The disciples' prayer, a prayer that he taught his disciples to pray as a model, a pattern, helping us to know how we can approach God rightly as we commune with him as our Heavenly Father. And so over the last few weeks, we've talked about this Lord's Prayer, how the Lord's Prayer is really broken up into to two sections. You have three petitions that are directed towards God and God's glory, and then you have another three petitions directed towards us and our needs. And so we've studied these over the last few weeks. We, we begin in the Lord's Prayer. Jesus teaches us first and foremost, we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And remember, we learned there that our Father, that word Father is Abba, dearest Father, Daddy. It's, it's the understanding that we have a loving Heavenly Father who longs for us to come into his presence and commune with him and, and spend time with him. And, and so we elevate the name of our dearest Father. We pray, hallowed be your name. That's our first heart's cry. And then we pray, Lord, we want your kingdom to come. We want your reign to, to encompass this world. We want to be a part of advancing that kingdom today in spreading the gospel to all peoples. But more than that, Lord, we long for the day when you return and you set up your rule and reign over this world and, and reign in righteousness and justice. And so we pray your kingdom come. Jesus then teaches us to pray, your will be done, because we recognize that his will isn't currently being done in this world as it is in heaven. And so we pray, Lord, start that in my life. Help me to honor you in obedience. Help me walk in faithfulness. Lord, help me to, to help my community and my nation and, and the people of the world see the blessing that comes when we walk in fidelity to your ways. Your will be done, Lord. And then we switch over to these second set of petitions in the Lord's Prayer, pr petitions for our needs. And last week we talked about recognizing that we go to the Lord in humility and we pray, Lord, provide us with our daily bread. Give us our daily sustenance. Give us everything that we need to live in this world, Lord. We are dependent on you. You are the creator and we are the creation. And so we recognize our dependency on God and we go to him daily for his provision. Today, we're going to look at this fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Recognizing the reality of the sins that we've committed against God. The debt that we owe God for failing to live up to his moral law in our lives. And then next week, we're going to look at the concluding statement in this Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's a perfect conclusion to our Lord's Prayer as we head into Holy Week and we look forward to Good Friday and to Easter, that holiday where we celebrate Jesus freeing us from the bonds of the enemy, from, from giving us victory over sin and temptation by forgiving us of all of our debts through his work on the cross. This Lord's Prayer, friends, is such a perfect prayer for us to be patterning our prayer lives after. And, and again, Jesus didn't give us this to, to pray it necessarily word for word. There's nothing wrong if we pray it word for word and we memorize this prayer. But it really is a pattern to help guide our prayer lives as his people. Let's read the Lord's Prayer together this morning. And then we're going to have a quick word of prayer and, and then ask the Lord to bless our time as we study this fifth petition together today. Let's read this together. Jesus says to his disciples, pray then like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to be here together. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Lord, we desire that your name be glorified this morning in all that we do here. And Father, we pray that you would now reveal the truth of your word to us. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would open our eyes to, to the power of this fifth petition, to the reality of the debt that we owe you, God, to the reality that you are our gracious Savior who has so 
lavished your love and care for us that you sent your son Jesus to die for our sins. God, give us a fresh vision of these realities today. And may they once again inspire us to to hunger for you, to, to worship you, to live for you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're looking at this fifth petition in the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Now, for those of you who grew up reciting the Lord's Prayer, right away we know that the Lord's Prayer oftentimes evokes a a sense of confusion when we pray it, right? Maybe you've been in public gatherings, weddings, or funerals, or church services, and and, uh, you're not quite sure, am I supposed to say, forgive us our debts, or forgive us our trespasses, Right? Have you ever wrestled with that before? I remember a few years ago, I did a, I did a wedding for a young couple. It was, it was classic, super hilarious situation. I had done premarital counseling with this couple. We had talked about communication and conflict resolution, and I had preached on some of those themes in my sermon at their wedding ceremony. And, and this couple had requested that after the message that I lead the congregation in the Lord's Prayer. So here I am leading the congregation of the Lord's Prayer. I got the husband, I got the, I got the bride and the groom standing in front of me. We get to the phrase, and forgive us. The bride says our debts, and the groom says our trespasses. And right away, they look at each other. And I'm thinking, oh no, we got to have some counseling right here in the middle of the Lord's Prayer, right? This is really a common issue for a lot of people. Do we pray forgive us our debts or do we pray forgive us our trespasses? Where, where, does that, where does that difference come from? Well, here's the background of that. The Anglican Church in England uses a, a pattern of, of worship, a liturgical book called the Book of Common Prayer. And in the Book of Common Prayer, the Book of Common Prayer uses the phrase, forgive us our trespasses as we have forgiven those who trespass against us. And so in America, the denominations that have come out of an Anglican tradition, groups like Episcopalians and Methodists and Wesleyans, they grew up speaking and praying, forgive us our trespasses. Pretty much every other Protestant tradition follows the King James Version of the Lord's Prayer and prays, forgive us our debt. So that's where the difference comes from. Now, here's the reality. Those two words are different words in Greek, but, but they basically mean, mean the same thing. What they mean is that we have sinned against God. We have rebelled against our creator. We have transgressed his moral will for our lives. So it's really not too consequential whether you pray forgive us our debts or forgive us our trespasses. We're not going to solve that debate here this morning. But that's kind of the background for it. But there's some important points that we need to recognize in what Jesus is calling us to pray for here in this fifth petition. In this fifth petition, when Jesus calls us to pray, and when he calls us to pray, forgive us our debts, he's reminding us of three things. The first thing that Jesus is reminding us here in this fifth petition is our desperate need. He's reminding us of our desperate need. Now understand this, friends. To be a debtor in the time of Jesus... When, when, the king, the, when, when uh, Israel was under Roman occupation, when the Roman Empire ruled the world, to be a debtor was a serious matter, okay? In the Roman Empire, basically there were three punishments for somebody who found themselves in debt and they could not pay that debt. You could be declared by the court uh, uh, an addictus, Okay, that was the term in Latin, an addictus. And to be referred to as an addictus meant that you were indebted to somebody or you were bound to somebody. This is where we get our English word addict from, right? Somebody who's addicted to drugs or addicted to cigarettes or addicted to alcohol, right? Addictus means to be bonded to somebody, to be devoted to something. And this was sort of an indentured servanthood, right? You would be placed under the servanthood of your creditor until you paid off that debt. A a second way that you could be punished as a debtor in the Roman Empire was to be sold into foreign slavery. Now, that was pretty bad because, like, a Roman citizen couldn't be a slave to another Roman, but your creditor could sell you into slavery to somebody outside of the Roman Empire, and that meant you no longer had any protection. You had no covering. You had no rights. That was, that was a really horrible fate. The third fate, however, was even worse. 
If you couldn't pay your debts in the Roman Empire, according to the, the 12 tables, the law of the Roman Empire, your creditors could literally, after a period of months of not repaying you, you could be murdered and your body literally divided up in equal portions amongst your creditors as payment. How many of you remember the Shakespeare's play, The Merchant in Venice, right? There's that famous statement, a pound of flesh, right? You know where that term pound of flesh comes from? It comes from this Roman practice of dividing the debtor's body amongst his creditors. We're going to give you a pound of flesh to pay his debt. So understand, this was the background to Jesus' teaching during his time. When he says, forgive us our debts, everybody hearing that teaching would have understood that debt was a serious matter. And Jesus uses this idea of debts to really highlight an even greater debt that each of us owe. Right Today, we think of debt as sort of an inconvenience, maybe a cause of stress and anxiety. But in Jesus' day, to be a debtor was a serious offense with serious consequences. And Jesus uses that idea to help us recognize the greatest debt that we owe, our debt to God. Jesus says, forgive us our debts. Recognizing that we have a fundamental problem. We have an urgent issue that we need to deal with our debt to God. He's reminding us here that as God's creation, we owe him our obedience. And we failed to pay up. And so we have a debt to pay to our creator God. The apostle Paul describes our dilemma like this in Romans chapter 3. He, he says, none is righteous, no, not one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our creator God is holy, he is perfect, he is righteous, he has no sin. And Paul points out, we are not holy. We are not righteous. We are sinners in debt to our holy God. And as a result of our sin, friends, we stand before our creator guilty fully deserving of his just punishment. Jesus elsewhere in his teachings tells us that that just punishment is an eternity separated from our creator God in hell. The reality of our debt is serious business. And so our only hope, friends, in order to avoid that punishment is to cry out to God, Lord, forgive us our debts. Friends, we need to recognize and feel the weightiness of this prayer. You, you need to hear this prayer and contemplate this prayer and pray this prayer with a clear and honest vision of all the ways you have transgressed God's will for your life. Every lie you've told, everything you've ever stolen, every time you've used the Lord's name in vain, every curse word you've ever sworn, every hatred you've ever harbored in your heart, every lustful thought, every pornographic image, every act of adultery, every time you've been drunk, all of these things, friends, we've transgressed God's will for our lives. We need to pray this prayer in recognition of the massive debt we owe our holy God. Debts that we are absolutely helpless to repay. Friends, how many times have you transgressed God's will for your life? Listen to the words of author Herman Witsius. He says, had we contracted by one debt of this kind, would not the thought of it have been enough to fill our mind with indescribable horror? But we are chargeable with debts. Debts of every description, original, imputed, inherent, and actual. Debts of omission and commission, of ignorance, infirmity, and deliberate wickedness, without limits and without number. Friends, we owe debts to our holy creator God. And Jesus calls us to pray, forgive us our debts acknowledging how desperately we need God's forgiveness. This is a recognition that we have betrayed him. We are indebted to him for mercy, and we are desperate for his amazing grace. 
Friends, understand when we pray this prayer, forgive us our debts, this is a gospel prayer. This is a prayer desperate for God's amazing grace. What is the gospel? The, the word gospel means good news. Al Mohler summarizes the gospel like this in his book on the Lord's Prayer. He says the sum and substance of the gospel is that a holy and righteous God who must claim a full penalty for our sin both demands that penalty and provides it. His self-substitution is Jesus Christ the Son whose perfect obedience and perfectly accomplished atonement on the cross purchased all that is necessary for our salvation. Jesus Christ met the full demands of the righteousness and justice of God against our sin. Friends, that's the gospel, the good news. We owe a debt to God, a debt that we could never fully repay. But God in his great love for us, in his mercy, in his amazing grace, he provided the payment for that debt by sending Jesus as the perfect substitute and sacrifice for our sins. Paul describes this like this in 2 Corinthians 5.21. He says, for our sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin, the one who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. What Paul says is that God sent his perfect son into this world, the sinless one, to be the savior. He, he was the perfect representative of the human race. He was fully man. He was fully God. And being fully man, he could be the perfect substitute for our sins. But in being fully God, he lived a sinless life. Therefore, when he went to the cross, he was the perfect spotless lamb of God. The perfect sacrifice. The perfect substitute for our sins. And when Jesus died on that cross 2,000 years ago, he took all of our sin upon himself. He took all of that massive debt burden that we owe our holy God. He took it upon himself and he nailed it to the cross as a sacrifice. And he cried out on the cross his final words, to tell us die, it is finished. The debt has been paid. This is what Jesus did for us. Paul says in Romans 3, 23 and 24, for all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but the good news, we are also justified, made right with our creator God by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God gave his son as a gift to redeem us. That word redemption means to be bought out of slavery. We are no longer bond slaves. We are no longer indentured servants. We are no longer slaves to our sin and accountable to the moral credit debt that we owe God. It's because of Jesus and his amazing grace that we are forgiven, redeemed, justified, brought back into God's family. And as that great gospel verse says, John 3, 16, God so loved this world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Friends, have you ever thought about what that verse is saying? What that verse is saying is that by trusting in Jesus, by believing in Jesus, by believing that he was God's gift for us, the perfect substitute for our sins, by believing in him, God forgives our debts and we are no longer accountable for our sins because Jesus took the debt of our sin upon himself so that we could know new life with God today and eternal life with God forevermore. Friends, have you put your trust in Jesus Christ? Because he truly is our only hope. And so we pray, forgive us our debts. Because we recognize that Jesus is the one who's provided forgiveness for our sins. Friends, are you starting to see again more clearly this morning just how amazing God's grace truly is? What a gift he's given us in his son, Jesus Christ. How kind our father in heaven has been to us. Do we not owe him our worship? Do we not owe him our very lives? Friends, there might be somebody here this morning who's never prayed this prayer as a gospel prayer. 
Maybe you're here today and you've prayed the Lord's Prayer hundreds of times. You've prayed, forgive me my debts a hundred times. But for you, maybe it's just been ritual. Maybe it's just been words that you said and, and said along with the crowd at a worship service or at a wedding or a funeral. But maybe today, maybe today you long to pray this prayer from your heart for the very first time. Maybe today you long to pray, Lord, forgive me my debts so that I can be justified and made right with you, my creator, God. Friends, if you'll pray that prayer from your heart, God will hear that prayer. His amazing grace is for you too. And he can transform you and forgive you of your sins like he has for so many of us here this morning. The second thing that Jesus teaches us here when he teaches us to pray, forgive us of our debts. Jesus reminds us of our dearest longing, our dearest longing. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, the Apostle Paul makes this incredible promise. He says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. In that great statement, friends, we're no longer condemned because of our trust in Jesus Christ. He's paid our penalty. He's paid our debt. There's no more condemnation. But now this raises a question for us, for those of us who are Jesus people, who trust Jesus, who are walking with Jesus. Do we still need to pray this petition? Right? Do we still need to pray, forgive us our debts? I mean, if Jesus has already forgiven us, is this still a relevant prayer for Jesus people? And I heard my friend up here say, yes, it is. Absolutely. It absolutely is a relevant prayer for Jesus people. You see, friends, the first time we pray this prayer, praying it sincerely from our hearts, forgive my debts, O Lord. We pray that prayer standing before God as our judge. But once we are saved and forgiven by Jesus, now we pray that prayer, forgive us our debts, standing before God as our heavenly father, our Abba. And as children of our heavenly father, we desire that nothing comes between us and God. We long for a pure and unblemished fellowship with God. J.I. Packer says it like this. He, he says, the Lord's prayer is a family prayer in which God's adopted children address their father, and though their daily failures do not overthrow their justification, things will not be right between them and their father till they have said sorry and asked him to overlook the ways they have let him down. Friends, when, when we pray and trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, we are saved. God forgives us of our sins once and for all time. The, the, the eternal debt that we owe God has been removed. Jesus has paid that debt. And when we trust in him, we need not fear that our sins have been dealt with once and for all. And that we are saved. And we will never lose that salvation if we have trust in Jesus with a sincere heart. But the reality is, we know that as we go through life as imperfect people, as people who still struggle with our former sinful nature, right, in this fallen sinful world, we know that we'll still fall into temptation at times, that we'll still walk into sin or stumble into sin. And in those situations, we need God's forgiveness. It's sort of like our relationship with our children, right? If you're a parent here, right, you know how this works. For me, with my kids, when my kids rebel against my rules at home, right? When, when they break the, the family rules and they've, they've damaged our relationship, they've hurt our, our fellowship because of their poor choices, right? I don't disown my kids. I don't stop loving my kids, but there's now a rift in our relationship. And an apology is necessary. They need to come to me or my wife and ask for our forgiveness, to restore the joy of our fellowship again. Friends, that's exactly how it works with our Heavenly Father. And so we pray, Lord, forgive us of our debts. We need to go to our Heavenly Father and ask Him to supply our daily bread, and we also need to go to Him daily and regularly and ask Him to forgive us of all of the ways that we transgress His will for our lives, robbing the joy of our fellowship with Him sullying the, the, the pleasure of our relationship with him. And so in this sense, friends, when we pray forgive us our debts, we're recognizing that we're praying this prayer as a prayer of sanctification. It's not just a prayer of justification that first time that we are forgiven and made right with our Heavenly Father, but it's a prayer of sanctification. 
And sanctification is our ongoing process of growing in our walk with Jesus, in our relationship with our Heavenly Father, as we are empowered by His Holy Spirit that lives within us. Okay, we walk through this world and we long to be like Jesus. We want long to grow in fellowship with our Father in Heaven. But again, friends, the, the tentacles of sin still cling to us. And the realities of this fallen world are still ever present. The temptations, the idols, the deceptions, right? And we are so prone to wander. But God in his amazing grace tells us that when we come to him as our father in heaven and ask him to forgive us of our sins, that he'll do that. He'll honor that request. This is what Jesus taught his disciples at the, at the last supper. Friends, do you remember at the Last Supper, Jesus was going around the table and he was washing his disciples' feet. And he came to the Apostle Peter. And the Apostle Peter said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Are you kidding me? Listen to this interesting exchange between Jesus and Peter. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then not just my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And Peter, you are clean, but not every one of you. He was referring to Judas who was about to betray him. But friends, understand what Jesus says here to Peter. Peter says, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus says, look, if if you don't allow me to wash your feet, you have no part in me. But then Peter says, okay, fine, Lord, then don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body. And Jesus says, Peter, you don't need a bath because you're already clean. And what he was referring there to was the fact that Peter was already justified. Peter was already right with God because he had already declared his faith in Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior. Now, Jesus hadn't died on the cross, but God had already credited Peter's faith as righteousness, like with many of the Old Testament saints. And so Peter was already clean. He didn't need a full bath. But Jesus says, Peter, your feet are still dirty. You're still living in this fallen world. You still wrestle with sin and temptation. And and Peter, to be honest with you, your stinky feet, (laughs) they're an offense to God. And so you need to wash your feet, Peter. And that's how it is with us, friends, as we go through life as Jesus' people. Yes, we've been forgiven. We don't need a new bath. We don't need to pray that God will give us salvation every time we fall into sin. But we do need to wash our feet. We need to confess those sins. We need to restore the proper fellowship with our Heavenly Father that our sins damage and hinder. And so we pray, as the Apostle John tells us in 1 John 1, 9. John says this, and remember, friends, he's writing to Christians here. He says, if we, have, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. In other words, don't think just because you've been forgiven and justified and you prayed that salvation prayer that you're not going to struggle with sin anymore. If you think you go through life and you're scot-free now, that's That's wrong. You've been deceived. But here's the good news. If you confess your sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that good news, friends? When we sully our relationship with our Father in heaven, he doesn't disown us. He doesn't turn his back on us. He says, pray, forgive us of our debts. Lord, wash my feet again. Clean me up again so that there's nothing offensive in my life so that I can walk in the purity and joy of right fellowship with you. Friends, are are there any debts in your life today that you owe God? Maybe you've prayed that prayer of salvation. Maybe you've put your trust in Jesus. But even as a Christian, you know, man, I still struggle with sin. I still fall into sin on a regular basis. Lord, I long to be faithful to you. I long to walk rightly with you. I want the joy of my relationship with you. And so Jesus, please forgive my debts. Forgive anything in my life that has sullied my relationship with you. And friends, God promises when we ask him for that forgiveness, he cleanses us of all unrighteousness and we can walk in the purity and joy 
of proper fellowship with him. The third thing that Jesus teaches us here in praying, forgive us our debts, he reminds us of our divine responsibility. Friends, forgiveness is not just a need for Jesus' people. It's also a responsibility. And here in this prayer, Jesus reminds us that as his children, we have a responsibility to extend forgiveness to others as he has extended his forgiveness to us. And when we do this, friends, we find freedom from relational brokenness with others, and we find freedom from the emotional pain that a lack of forgiveness causes in our own lives. Let's look again at the second half of this fifth petition, but, but also the commentary that Jesus provides for this prayer in verses 14 and 15. Jesus says, pray, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And then a few verses later, he adds this important commentary. What does this verse mean? He says, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now, right away, friends, if you're, if you're like a normal person, you're going to read this and immediately scratch your head in bewilderment, okay? Like, Jesus, what, what are you saying here? Right? Are, are you saying that my forgiveness is conditional? And if that's the case, doesn't that mean like our salvation is now tied to our works? Like if I don't forgive somebody else, you're not going to forgive me? Is that what Jesus is saying here? Friends, this is another classic example of how we need to interpret Scripture in light of the rest of Scripture. We know from God's word that salvation is by grace through faith. We've already seen that. It's a free gift. We do not earn it. We do not work for it. We cannot buy it. It's a free gift from God. So what exactly is Jesus saying here? Well, the simplest way to explain this, friends, is Jesus is simply saying here that forgiven people will be forgiving people. Okay? Forgiven people will be forgiving people. Jesus' people are those who recognize just how much God has forgiven us, and as a result, we can't help but live with a spirit of forgiveness towards others. And as Jesus' words here in verses 14 and 15 challenge us to consider, if we don't possess a spirit of forgiveness, we need to contemplate whether we truly understand the extent of what God has done for us in pardoning our debts and forgiving us of our trespasses. Friends, understand this morning, hard hearts have no place among Jesus' people because the way of Jesus is the way of love and grace and reconciliation. Jesus so graciously extended these things to us. How can we not extend them to others? And this isn't just Jesus' message here, but it's the consistent will of God for us found throughout Scripture. Remember what Jesus said back in the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. James, the earthly brother of Jesus, he writes, for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Jesus in Luke chapter 6 says, judge not and you will not be judged. Condemn not, you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. In Matthew 18, 21 and 22, Peter comes to Jesus and says, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus says to Peter, no, no, Peter, not seven times, but 77 times. In other words, you just keep on forgiving. Jesus then, in a few verses later, he tells the story, the parable of the, the, the uh, ungrateful servant, the unforgiving servant, who, who this servant owed his master this massive debt. And the master graciously forgave the servant of his debt. But then the servant turns around and he goes down and he finds his friend who owes him a really small debt. And he beats up his friend and he throws him in jail. And the master hears about this and the master summons the servant and says, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. 
So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Again, friends, what is Jesus teaching here? He's simply teaching this. Forgiven people will be forgiving people. When we understand what God has done for us, when we understand our need for his amazing grace in our lives, when we receive that grace and appreciate that grace, we then, friends cannot help but extend that same grace to others. Now understand, this doesn't mean that we should expect or not expect any consequences for other people's bad behavior. Okay, This doesn't mean that we don't exercise discernment towards people who have wronged us or harmed us. This doesn't even mean that forgiveness will always come easy. But what this means is that for Jesus' people, our hearts will be bent towards grace. Are we growing in grace? Do we have a spirit of grace? And if we can't answer that question affirmatively, friends, we need to continually look to Jesus. And we need to reflect on how much he's forgiven us. And we need to ask him to continue our shaping our hearts more and more into his image. Friends, Our world desperately needs Jesus' people willing to live the kingdom ethic of forgiveness. People today are so divided and broken. For many in our world, bitterness, hatred, and revenge are the only answers they see to these divisions. But as we know, friends, the gospel offers a better way the way of forgiveness, the way of healing, the way of freedom. This is our responsibility as Jesus' people. And it's a divine responsibility. For as we live with a spirit of forgiveness towards others, we are reflecting the very spirit of God within us. Friends, is there somebody in your life today that you need to forgive? If so, do it. Do it. Ask the Spirit to help you. Ask God to continue shaping your heart to be a person who reflects the forgiveness God has so graciously granted you. And extend that forgiveness, seeking reconciliation, seeking healing, seeking freedom from the burden that you're carrying today. Let's close in prayer this morning and ask the Holy Spirit to continue this work of conforming us into the image of our gracious Savior. God, we just thank you for this message you've given us this morning. And Lord, we acknowledge that it is a challenge to forgive others of the debts that they owe us. But Jesus, when we're challenged with forgiving others, I pray that we will look to the cross, that we will remember your great sacrifice for us, that we will remember the freedom from debt that we've experienced because of your amazing grace, and that we might graciously grant forgiveness to those who have wronged us because you are a gracious God. Lord, I pray that if there's anybody here this morning who's never accepted the gracious payment for debt that we owe you, the payment that you paid through your son Jesus when he went to the cross and died for our sins, that even this morning they might open their heart to you and recognize Jesus as the only way to be forgiven of that great, unpayable debt. Only Jesus can pay that debt. And we thank you, Lord, for your mercy, for your grace, for your kindness towards us. Lord, help us to be people who live faithfully for you, seeking to honor you. When we sin against you, Lord, may we be quick to cry out, forgive us our debts, and restore us back to right fellowship with you. Thank you so much, Lord, for giving us this crucial teaching. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and worship in response. I've carried a burden for too long on my own. bear it alone 
Friends, if any of you would like prayer this morning, I want to invite you to come up to the front. Some of our elders and Stephen ministers will be here, and we would love to pray with you. Let me leave you with these words from Romans, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. God bless you, friends, and have a great week. Amen. Hey, friends, thanks for joining us online today. If you have further questions, are in need of prayer, or would like to give financially to the ministries of Lakes Free Church, I encourage you to visit our website, lakesfree.org. There you'll also find information regarding our upcoming events. You can access Access all of our past sermon series along with a host of other valuable resources. If you're in the area, we'd love to have you join us in person for one of our Sunday services or other events. We'd love to meet you. Thanks again for joining us and may God bless you.